Thank you all for coming today. This is our very last public program for the Intimate Divacorn Exhibition. And uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity to, um, for the museum to give the final public thank you to the show's underwriters, Simon and Kimberly Blattner, and the Bank of New York Mellon uh, for bringing this exhibition, uh, making it possible for us. And I'd also like to thank everyone at the Richard Divacorn Foundation who's been extraordinarily um, generous in their time and their ideas and their support of this exhibition. We really could not have done it without them. I'm also very grateful for the speakers we have here today, as they both have had significant roles in bringing the spotlight back to the art of Richard Dean Corn these last two years, and of course, bringing this show to Sonoma. Chester Arnold originally conceived this exhibition for the College of Marin, working closely with the Dean Corn Foundation to select a collection of David Korn's works that had rarely, if ever, had been seen by the public. During this process, Chester partnered up with Bart Schneider, a poet and novelist, who is also the publisher and editor of Kelly's Cove Press. Together, they set to work on a series of three books from the model, Abstractions on Paper, and Still Lives and Landscapes that would serve as a portal into a more personal perspective on Richard Demon Korn. About these books, David Poulin of the Los Angeles Times wrote, not catalogs, but something far more intimate, like a piece of the artist you can hold in your hand. That's the point, of course, for the material they bring together operates in similar fashion, drawing us ever closer to the page. Today we're invited through another portal, the curators and the editors, as Chester and Bart share their recollections of compiling these books through yet another set of images that did not make the cut for the exhibition or the books. The B-side, if you will. The drawings that maybe served some singular purpose for David Korn or worked out a particular problem that eventually led to a breakthrough or maybe another dead end. Still, they've got something worth a closer look. Chester and Bart, thank you so much for being here today sharing this process with us. Question that came on from Bart about, uh, and 
I'm just recollecting this. It's probably not 100% accurate. You can correct me if you, maybe you're knowing you better or so. Uh, but I got a call and I was looking for someone who did figurative work to accompany a book that a poems, poem, or poem-like pieces written by a poet, Janine Marantini. And after a couple of suggestions, we eventually led to the idea, well, I know someone on the faculty of the college and then whose wife worked with Phyllis Beaton Horn, and they said that the foundation is a really friendly group, so why not give them a call and see if they would be interested in sharing some of their drawings, which I knew they had. And kind of that's, that was kind of the propulsive moment that set the whole thing in motion. <laughs> well, I kind of, before I talk about that book, which is Poses, uh, i got to back up to um, the time I met Chester, because as you say, Andy and Willa from, from the bookstore had, had an event at their house, a, a dinner at uh, the book bar, they called their house, um, and there were 20 writers that she generously gathered I was moving back to California from Minnesota, and um, and this one painter, and, and you were the only one I wanted. Why was I? Because you're a literary. <laughs> but uh, I was uh, thinking of um, starting a magazine in Sonoma, which uh, proved untenable because it seemed like the only kind of magazine you could truly start in Sonoma had to do with wine. <laughs> I know too little about it and couldn't make it slick enough. Um, so a year or two went by and I got the idea of starting a press, a small press um, that would be focused on California literary um, works and, and California painting with the idea that every cover would be a cover by a different California painter. Um, and in the first season, I was kind of mad and made six books, way too many, for a kind of one-person show. And um, Chester, I think if it's okay, I'm going to pass a couple books out so you can see them. This was uh, one of the first, in the first season that Chester and I did together, and it's, um, you know, I'm casting around for writers I don't have to pay royalties to, and one of them happened to be Ambrose Bierce, who had died or disappeared a hundred years before. Um, and he has a wonderful collection of Civil War stories that are, in fact, anti-war stories. Um, they're, they're fairly gruesome, and I immediately thought of Chester's paintings of <laughs> realistic, uh, I think, you know, Chester paints atrocities as well as anybody, whether it's the atrocities uh, occasioned by logging or um, just the accumulations of things that have been dumped. And somehow we work together putting choosing images, and I think it worked out to be a really, um, I mean, it, it's almost hard to tell that these paintings were painted 150 years or so after the Civil War. Um, you know, there's a few things that are, that are in there that are anachronistic, like um, boots that couldn't have been made then, or things like that, but most of it... Universal destruction. Universal destruction, yeah. Um, so, so and, and I found myself relying on, on Chester for just about every artistic decision I was making. I have some background in art, uh, not making it, looking at it, and I have, I think, good eyes, but Chester has so much knowledge um, that he was always my go-to person. And so, as he said, when we Oops. got to the point of making poses, which is a really interesting book that um, the writer Jenny Lentine is a poet 
who at that time was the poet in residence at the San Francisco Zen Center. And she has a sense of attention to detail and um, that I guess um, seems like my outsider's idea of something Zen, you know. And um, what she did was uh, attend a couple years of drawing sessions. She had been on an artist model before, but now she was attending sessions and instead of drawing, she was writing from the poses. Um, and I'd never seen anything like it, so, but it seemed like it needed to have some figure drawings to go along with it. And um, we thought, our Chester thought of Deep and Corn, you know, and I remember what he said, might as well try for the best. <laughs> And so I called up the foundation, which um, was generous from the start. They're just phenomenal people over there. And it happened to be, um, I lived most of the time in Berkeley, and they were half a dozen blocks from my house. And I got to meet with them, and Chester and I, well, I don't think you were really picking the images for this first No, time. I didn't. I wasn't involved right. in picking those. Yeah, but I went with the poet and the designer. and. I was still learning how to make books, as I still am, and um, the poet had a very distinct idea. She wanted a particular designer she knew, and um, I kind of felt like I was obliged to um, accept the whole package. And uh, it turned out the designer was very good, but the poet wanted um, Diebenkorn's name, which you can maybe see up there shrunken, you know, and it also, there was a, a foreword we got to the book by a very famous American poet, Mark Doty, which is full of praise for the book, and that's also shrunken, so when we sell out of this, which I hope won't be too long to do a second printing, uh, I'm taking the book back, and Stephen Korn's name is going to be here. <laughs> He's giving us so much. Yeah. It, but uh, they also did a, a strange thing that I, again, felt like I didn't really, if the foundation approved it, I was going to go along with it. They took details from some of the drawings and put them on pages without reference to the whole drawing. So the parts of the drawings became, to me, like design elements, which I think is, you know, to a great artist like that, to any artist is maybe not respectful enough. Um, somehow, you know, the Deep Important Foundation said, well, just as long as uh, you put the whole image in the book. So they did that, but the whole image is somewhere apart from where the details are, so you don't know what the details come from unless you're, you know, doing jigsaw puzzle with your books. <laughs> It is. I think it's a testimonial to the quality of the drawings, though, that even in a crop version, you can feel how great the hand is that's moving across the page. Mm -hmm. Granted, that's not the full piece, but it is something, there's something to be said to that. When you look through those details, it's rather like looking at the drawings here when you're up close to them, and if you're up really close, you can only just see one piece at a time, one section at a time. The rewards are endless, as with all visual art that you encounter and can move, spend some time with and contemplate. Uh, there are rewards at every level uh, of the best for you, which I think this is. That's true. So after developing some relationship with the Diebenkorn Foundation, I, I found out that the De Young Museum was the next um, June. So this was in the fall, we, we made this book in, in seven or eight months. The De Young Museum was going to um, have a major retrospective. What was that called? The, the Berkeley College? Years. The, Berkeley the Berkeley Years. Berkeley Years show, which you probably all saw if you're here. You probably saw that show too. Phenomenal <laughs> show. And the, the little dwarfed sense of enterprising I have thought, ooh, if I could bring out 
a Deacon Corn book or two in advance of that show, I might sell a few. Yeah. And, um, that's when I approached them about doing a book just of some part of his work on paper. And Chester and I went by the offices and they showed us, I think, we have some images here. The pages are sometimes set up the way that we saw them. Uh, some of them have dates. Um, and first, we should say that the, the foundation had, I think, over 1,300 works in files that had never been framed, that had basically never been shown, uh, and it had never been really seen by anybody except the archivists at the center. And they are just at the, at the end of the process of assembling the preparations for the catalog resume of Richard E. Porn, which I think is coming out next year. It's the, the summation of everything that he did that was known and authenticated. So all these pieces had been, fortunately for, for, for us, had been photographed beautifully in a high resolution image so that they could be used with, pretty seamlessly for publication purposes if, if it came to that point. So we ended up spending a couple of, I don't remember how many days we actually did together, but at least a couple of days looking through these files, and it was just one page after. They, they were three on a page, as I remember. Yeah, there were three on a page, but what you're looking at here, and I think the, the impression that was made to me as, a, as an artist and an and educator, it gave an access to a view of Demon Corn's work that I had, well, I had some hints of in, in reproductions of drawings and the new he's great drawer, but there were pieces that were extraordinarily uh, accessible to the average artist, to the average student. They could look at it and begin to understand, okay, I can see what he was doing. I, in, in many cases, he was just drawing from a model. He wasn't trying to make great art. He was just having a visual experience. And uh, what we had to do is figure out, well, how do you take work that's almost universally great and cherry pick it? And that's a really, that was a really interesting problem. But I found that he would come up with a list and I'd come up with a list and compare notes, and there was very, very little difference in the two views, which says something about the continuity of our vision, maybe, and our, our appreciation. But in some of these pieces, I think that a lot of the attributes are present in other works that are in the show, and to be quite honest, some of these may be in the books, I don't know. If yeah, I, think, I, think, I think a lot yeah. of them are. Yeah, I, I, these weren't just the outtakes. This, this was like these whole sheets. And so what, what happened was um, Andrea at the foundation would send me um, like 200 images on three to a page. And it was kind of mind boggling <laughs> to figure out how to, I mean, I liked them all. Yeah. <laughs> it's an embarrassment of riches really. And, and then to ultimately figure out which image would play against which image, um, and to take the three and see them as two. Um, it's, and, and I never had the advantage that you later did of, of seeing any of them in the flesh. They were all in boxes somewhere, um, in archived, and, and when you and Chris West um, worked on curating the College of Marin show that did, became this, um, you got to see some actual live pieces. Yeah. And there were things of, aspects of this work, which I think if you were here for Gretchen uh, Grant, for, for, for Gretchen Grant, even Corn's um, presentation, she talked about the fact that he painted sometimes and drew on, on, on materials that were less than top notch arches, 100% water, but, but he was working on cardboard the backs of uh, cookie containers, painting over old posters. And that was extraordinarily uh, refreshing to find that this guy was really popular. Uh, there was almost a feeling of populism that sprang up from the page itself because his, his interest in doing his drawings was not, I don't think in, in, in any case, uh, an effort to make great art as a finished piece, but as a venue to examine his ideas and polish his ideas so that when he was before the stage of the canvas, he then could have the confidence to proceed. And I think the point was made in, in her talk as well that he didn't square off a drawing and project it into a larger scale. Everything was an improvisation. 
And I think that aspect of its improvisational character uh, and also appealed to both of us because, uh, you know, Bart has some background in jazz and the whole feeling of uh, literature that ran through it too. Stories about how Diebenhorn read the, the, was it Yeats he read to David Park as David Park was dying and then they found that the, the book that appears in one of his paintings was that very book and it's uh, kind of quite extraordinary and, and rich fabric that was woven through all the work from the first impression that one has as a student going to a museum and seeing people one's work full of like the Ocean Park show at the Open Museum, whenever that was, early on, and just feeling like you were in the presence of a god. <laughs> and how do you humanize that person? Well, you humanize them by maybe meeting them or studying their work to the degree that you realize this is a human being, granted a very gifted human being, very dedicated and hardworking human being. Uh, the drawings really gave evidence to, to the, I wouldn't call it hard work, but uh, concentrated work that, that he was capable of producing. And the numbers of them were just were stunning, and the numbers of them that were really fabulous were really stunning. I think your point about his um, drawing on whatever was available, or, or, or painting on, or, you know, he, he uses a lot of different um, medium on these works in paper. But you, you get the sense that um, the most important thing was he just, he, he had an itch almost. He had a scratch with, with he's constantly having to work. And um, I wonder how much his wife saw him during the day. <laughs> well, she saw a lot of him when he was, her, when he was drawing her, which was quite often. No, that's right. Uh, and she, that's another aspect of this which is really wonderful because Phyllis Steve Horn, who just passed away, was it earlier this year? Yes. Um, she was present and was very supportive of this whole project all the way along and actually ended up donating fam works from her own personal collection to the foundation so that they could then subsequently be shared with the public, the broader public. Because there's a lot of work in the family collection that doesn't go out except on rare occasion. And the foundation now has all this work and much, much more in this archive, which is just beginning. And this is really the first time that that archive has been tapped for uh, exhibits. And this was the first that was put together for that purpose. So if anybody has the ambition to want to put together another Demon Corn show with another focus, I would invite you, you know, call them up and see if they're interested. It's a lot of time and a lot of effort to, to work. Uh, but they, they, as Laura said, they're very extremely generous people. Phyllis ended up coming to the opening of the first exhibit at the college, which was just, and my professor from the Art Institute, Bruce McGaugh, who had been a close friend and student of Dean Corns, came. He hadn't seen Phyllis in years, I and mean, there were tears. It was, it was an amazing night. It was a really amazing night. And the other thing, a couple other things happened. I don't want to forget mentioning. Uh, I found out that one of the last times that I saw another professor of mine from the college, her name, Betty Wilson, who had retired and was dying of cancer had wandered into the show the night it was opening and she didn't have a ticket and I happened to see her. I said, let's just go in together, you know, before it opens. And we did. And I had met known that she had been a student of the points. I mean it all made sense all of a sudden because her work is very geometric. <coughs> so there's the there are these threads of influence coming in all directions that uh, another story that emerged and there's a drawing here just on the other side of the wall, the front wall here of a woman, Gilda Meyer, who had posed for Eden Corn when she was a student at Stanford. And she, uh, he did a series of drawings for her one day. And I don't know if it's one of those in here or not. But, uh, and he ended up giving her one of the drawings, which she kept a very precious gift, uh, and eventually sold it. And she was, she did, unfortunately, she felt very unfortunate about having to sell it, but at the same time, he paid for her graduate studies. Mm -hmm. Which says something about the you know the value of the Deacon Corn drawing too. So yeah, I've met so many people through this process that have had in their possession at one time or another uh, a drawing that he's given to them, mm -hmm. and they all seem to have swung away. It's kind of like real estate in Sonoma. You know, <laughs> anybody that bought forty years ago has probably sold the place to cash in. Well. I wanted to say something at you, sort of to before we go much further, uh, because as you're looking at these, I'm just kind of scroll through them so you can look at them. But uh, from a, from an art uh, kind of an aesthetic perspective, uh, 
a technical perspective, the drawings that for me fall into a, a range of drawings that were done from observation that were less concerned with the use of the entire page in the composition. Uh, and then others that were obviously much more carefully and sensitively built. It's almost like his mind was shifting back and forth from a drawing like this, which feels like a really quick study, uh, to a drawing like this, which feels even with a humorous little bubble, which I've never seen any other copy of. Uh, the, the entire page ends up being subdivided into a composition of darks and lights and textures and values that really make it feel almost like a full painting. Um, so the works have many different kinds of intensities of, of, of focus and finish, and that's a particular answer. What is she saying? I wonder why they have a message to propose in the mood. Jester, was that on your list? I don't think it was on mine. It, this one? It didn't make it in the book. Uh, you know, I think I liked it, but it was such a it was such an outlier because of the bubble. It sort of seemed like it took from the, from the dignity of the man. <laughs> but now that in retrospect, I think I'd rather like them. Okay, these are two, these two are examples, beautiful studies of uh, figures, but the, the page is being used in a really meaningful way. He's completely addressing every square inch of it. Man, I wish I had those. <laughs> And you know, throughout, you can see uh, echoes and occasions of uh, looking at the years they were done. Uh, you can you can see that what is coming down the road in retrospect. You can see little bits of geometry. What I I've started to refer to as Diebenkorn's parametrics, the the way that he divides space up and his interest in golden section and the, the subtlety of, of uh, proportions and values in, in his work uh, are extraordinary. For instance, the figure on the right here starts to feel like a woman standing in front of an ocean park piece, mm -hmm. or sitting in front of an ocean park piece. And it's all there. Oh, there's Gilda. That's Gilda on the left. That's the drawing he didn't get. Uh -huh. so. Uh, so getting back to the, to the, to the exhibit part of this, um, part of the Part of our luck in the timing and development of these ideas was that the, the foundation was just beginning to, the foundation was just ready to open itself up to possibilities of exhibit. We just happened to be there at the time and had, uh, they actually invited us to apply for a grant through the foundation to have the works that were selected framed because none of them were framed. And it's, they used as a framer in Berkeley that put some pieces in what they referred to as the standard even corn issue which was a maple frame with a simple floated uh, image uh, that gives you access to all edges of the paper. Um, and a rather beautiful and simple organization. But uh, the fact that we were able to do that and, and then have the show at, at a junior college of all places, our humble little college we're in, again, just happened to be opening a brand new gallery space, which was really gorgeous. And the, the, this precipitating event of the show helped press the college to finish it, which if anybody has any familiarity with colleges or institutions of any kind, you know, oh, next year, maybe six months from now, look at it. well, the show was either going to happen or it wasn't. It was lined up, it was set up. So they had to do put in an alarm system, sophisticated alarm system with video, uh, the whole security system. They had to finish painting and building the walls, which were still not done at the time the show was first uh, planned. So when this all happened, it just was a spectacular setting to for it as a launch. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have any pictures of that night, but I do have some somewhere in the archives. Uh, and then before, also, before we go any further, I wanted to thank Stan and Paul who are sitting up front here for their their installation of this show, which is. Each time a show is, is installed, it's a separate event and a separate opportunity for our, the artistry of the installer to achieve a, a, another vision. And it's really kind of a wonderful, really a wonderful and rich, a richer show than the Paul's of Rins because there are 12 more color pieces in there. So. Sorry for that one feed. Oh. I, I want to thank them, them particularly because they've given so much to the museum and uh, to not just this show, but many, many, many shows. In fact, we worked together for the uh, the Rembrandt etching show, 
that was another piece. So, okay, let's continue to look at I just thought I'd, I'd say a couple more things about the making of the books and the um, in the context of working with uh, the Devonport Foundation, who uh, Chester mentioned has been working, I think now for close to 16 years, making this three-volume artist resume, which for which they've flown around the world to photograph every known demon corn. And, um, you know, it's painstaking work. They have them printed in Italy, and um, two people from their staff go to watch the printing process and the proofing. And, and so I came along and said I wanted to do, I mean, when I saw the riches in their archive, I thought, well, it's more than one book. Let's, let's do one figures. Let's do one abstractions and um, and do them in the next few months. And, and they were like 13 years into their project. And they, they, they thought I was kind of nuts. But I mean, I suppose we were. We both were. Too. Yeah. I think doing it, but. But, you know, I mean, wanted to make the show in time, you know, they, they ended up arriving, I think, a week before the opening. Um, it, it was a little bit scary. Um, and, you know, my vision was kind of the absolute opposite of these enormous um, artist raisonné books that nobody really will buy mm -hmm. except collections and maybe some libraries. Um, and I, I also noted that um, when we looked, do you remember this, Jester? When we looked in their offices, at, at, we each had our own computer. We were, and one of them, the computer stand was was the artist resume box for Mark Rothko. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, wow! So this is what's going to happen. To uh, the box. That's a yeah. solid foundation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think one of the great aspects of producing a, an affordable cash, kind of a ca cash and carry book of the Dean Corn's work was it, it gave access to a lot of people who uh, just could pick it up at the counter for, uh, it's a, almost a painless transaction and it's such a rich little archive. But granted, maybe it's, it's not as sumptuous and the, the images aren't big, as big as the originals, but there's so much to enjoy in them that uh, we ended up uh, sharing them in the college. I know we had the foundation under, was underwriting the purchase of a number of copies so that they could be used as teaching tools, which this show has, another aspect of this, it has become a wonderful teaching tool to the universities where it has traveled. It went from, college went to San Jose, uh, did it go to Palm Springs or somewhere? Can't even, I think the list of venues is in, in the books, but it's turned out to be a marvelous tool for educators in drawing and painting uh, to talk about today see the work firsthand, and especially for any smaller college to have real even ones hanging on the wall is kind of a miraculous thing. It's like having the windows of Shark Cathedral somehow coming to, you know, to visit. It's, at least that's, a, that's how I think it. it was really a, a remarkable shot in the arm for the seriousness of everybody uh, involved in the program. And the books played, I think, a significant part in doing it. I also wanted to say that uh, the, 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 the sort of awareness that the world has of Richard Deacon Corn's work. To us in the Bay Area, it seems like it's, uh, and maybe in other circles internationally, it seems like a fait accompli, but that, in fact, when I went to present this project to the president of the college, he said, who? <laughs> this was a guy with a PhD. I mean, Grant, and to his credit, he embraced it completely, um, but he didn't, he was unfamiliar with Richard Deacon Corn, which kind of always amazes me, but it's only because my nose has been in the Museums my whole life, and it's, uh, I'm always surprised when no one's thinking and knowing the same things. So, <laughs> this has given Beaver Cornell kind of a popular plug in that it wasn't there before. And, and for students and people that can afford to pick them up and take them and study them and flip through them, I think it's a wonderful, really wonderful design. Somebody told me that one of the pleasures of these little books is that they can take them into the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> We have a waterproof copy of them. You can't drop them, but they're easier than taking one of those. Uh, 
And I still, you know, as much as I've looked at them, whenever I flip through them, I look through them, I still see things that I had overlooked. And I think that's the nature of the show, too. Uh, I've seen this several times now, uh, and here and in other places. And each time I go to, did I look at that piece completely? I don't think I do. Uh, maybe when our, our, our consciousness can only carry so much memory of what we've seen. Um, and I think it's uh, one of the wonderful things to, to have a museum where they're how many come and see them over and over. I should also say that um, <clears throat> one of my um, ideas was that I wanted as little text as possible. I didn't think that um, we needed um, people to interpret these for us or just be in the way. But, but Chester did write pithy introductions to two of the three volumes. And um, I think I gave him something like that. 500 word limit. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. In fact, Bart is such a brilliant editor, uh, I barely recognized my writing when it came out. <laughs> it seemed so readable and coherent. I thought, wow, that's why people have editors. <laughs> I'm, terms of, I'm rather an extemporaneous kind of lecturer at, at, at college, too. I don't prepare things so much, but it, stream of consciousness can be a very good thing if it's, if it's tight and long and it follows a path, but otherwise it can't be either. And especially yeah, after, after three or four clauses in a sentence. Well, you know, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to get verbal in relation to work in a, in a formal way as a, in, in a catalog or a book. And I, I consider it a great honor to, to be asked to do it. And I just was totally delighted to give it a shot. So. Yeah, you did as well. Yeah. Speaking of poets, there's the. Uh, I wanted to get some of these Kenneth Rex Ross portraits because uh, oh, there's only how many are there? There's only one. There's one in the show yeah, here. Yeah, there, there's there's two, two in the book, and I, I don't think either any of those are. Yeah, maybe yeah. the one in the far right, but the one that's back on the wall is that beautiful one with mm -hmm. the buttons and yeah. Is yeah, and I think that of oh, those, and this is a good example of how that one was chosen. I think for the show, it was the one that felt. Um, the most finished and the most fully realized, both as a, as a character study of him, but also as a description of the clothing and the use of the page. It was a real complete, uh, a really, not that these are in any way diminished, uh, but that the one that we have here, I think, is, is really full. Okay. You know, there, uh, technically, you, you'll see there's, there are several drawings, and I think a couple of them in the show, too, that are drawn with ballpoint pens on the back of the card shirt cardboard uh, or something like that. Uh, other, other things are done with Conte. This is a really early 1945, which, uh, is that in the book? Uh, I don't think so. I think, I couldn't remember whether that made the, made the book or not. Duel at Dawn. Mm -hmm. So it's done right after the Duke and Corps served as a Marine in the Second World War. Um, feeling very much like a part of what was emerging as um, Pre, pre Bay Area figurative school, but you can see the beginnings of it there for sure. Those almost look like David Park figures. Uh, this particular piece uh, became the only bone of contention in the development of the exhibit because uh, I wanted this to be a poster for the show mm -hmm. and I wanted it to be in the show, but the family couldn't part with it. They, it was too precious to them, they didn't. They Feared that you know they they considered that it had too much too great a value to be put out there into the world. Um, not that all of the works don't already have great value, but <clears throat> in my introduction I referred to him as one of the great the great drawers of scissors that's ever lived. I think, and to me one of the most beautiful images of the painted image of the scissor, which again points to the fact that he could make something out of nothing. It's kind of a magicianship of somebody that has a feeling for space color that like he had. I think in the, um, I, I put together the Still Life and Landscape book after these first two books and um, after the show had already moved around the country a little bit. And I think there may be six or seven pieces with scissors. So, and there's several with uh, knives. And you, you get the feeling that he worked on particular things like that over and over and over again. Uh, 
not good enough. I think this is one of the last pieces actually that he made uh, when he was living in Hillsdale. And there was a lot of speculation at the time when we were at the foundation about whether he was moving me back towards figuration again, towards a landscape. And it certainly seemed that way from some of the images that uh, we saw. One other note on that piece is that um, it, it was educational for me when I was putting the books together that um, um, in many cases I had things, I, I put things together that felt like they should go together, but they were on pages across from something that's dimension was far different. So the foundation, um, you know, had me go through and reorganize things that, and this was, this is a massive painting that um, we ended up doing uh, a fold out of in the abstraction book because there was no way of truly representing its size and scale to the rest of the pieces. And so there are a couple fold outs in that book that have paintings or images on each side. But yeah, you gotta look at those little numbers down at the corner of the page that tell you the dimensions. And I learned that pretty early on. One more foible I wanted to point out with uh, the bookmaking was um, we use this image, which is back there. I can see it from here. Mm -hmm. um, for, for the cover of the model book. Mm -hmm. And the designer, unbeknownst to me, cropped it uh. at the top. And you know, the book went to the foundation, and it, it lived in the world until um, through two editions until the Marin show hung and uh, they looked at it and saw that it had been cropped, um, which was very embarrassing. Um, I, you know, I'd only seen it on, in a computer, as a computer image and somehow, I don't know, but we, we corrected it in the third printing with uh, the full image. I, th I thought, uh, in fact, I think this is the last image of the group, which is kind of a nice uh, uh, series to, to look at, to have as a as a, something to just stare at for a while. But uh, Barr was referring to the number of studies of scissors that he did, and uh, I know for the first time I ever saw the unicorn's work, I think I was a first year college student, and there was a reproduction of one of his drawings in a Daniel Mandelowitz's art of drawing book, uh, art of drawing. And somehow certain things like that in life sort of reach out to you. And it was a study of objects on a table. I forget exactly what they were. Uh, tables with scissors and knives and uh, maybe a pen. And it somehow illuminated me and gave me uh, permission somehow. I know mean, that's a term that's overused in a lot these days. But it gave me the sense of permission that it was OK if this, this guy was a picture in the book, he must be famous, and he's drawing like this, I could do that. <laughs> and so I proceeded to do hundreds of drawings of stuff on the table, piles of which, and I have a particularly, I still do have a particularly geologically layered table of uh, stuff. And it was the beginning for me of really examining the geometries of commonplace things that led to well, much of the work that I've made throughout my life, and that is just paying attention to the overlooked for me was really inspired in a lot of ways by those, those early encounters. Um, I thought it might be interesting to have you read a, a piece from the Poses book as a, as a first part of a, a couple of readings. Uh, this starts to feel like city arts and lecture. Uh, with, uh, Hello, I'm Linda Hunt. <laughs> and, uh, join us. You, you've got a good ear. <laughs> um, is, it, is one of those Poses books still out there? Since you're on the poses <laughs> book, uh, uh, okay. 
And we're into the universe now. Maybe that's a good place to be. Could, could we bring up bring up one of the figures? Oh. That's a demon. That's what I Okay, so where did you want to go? Uh, let's just go to one of the there's a page there that has uh, yeah, that's from poses, so that'd be a good place to have a picture while you're reading. Yeah, I'll just read a couple very brief pieces. Many of these are very brief. Uh, the pose seeks to catch the model somewhere between where she thought she was so, supposed to be and where she thinks she is supposed to be. <laughs> There's, there's a lot of uh, pieces in here about the two-minute pose. <clears throat> a two, if I could have my life like a two-minute pose, look, see the gesture, embody the gesture. Water posits itself over the stone. It shapes the stone and is shaped. Time's up. <laughs> when this was first uh, released at, at a party at the McCroskey uh, Warehouse, in the Mattress Factory Warehouse show space, uh, we had a model posing with easels, people drawing. It was a great event, actually. It was a great event. I, I thought I would, uh, I would end. I, I don't know, how, how much time is it? Have we been an hour or so? I thought there should be some time for questions and answers. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to read part of the, uh, the uh, introduction to the Still Lives and Landscape book to you because uh, I never do that. And it's an opportunity for me to actually read something that I've read. And, uh, I may not do as good a job as maybe I'm talking off the top of my head, but um, I'll just read part of it. The, an artist <coughs> of Dieben Korn's formal gifts and focused energy gives us reasons to look again and again at the world within us, as well as the world around us. His visual poetry transports us in quivering wash and scrupulously relaxed linear compositions. He reminds us that even a few common tools and papers scattered on the table can become essential visual treasures. That dense belt of a suburban neighborhood is an occasion for transcendence a bracelet of geometry is tenderly wrought beneath the gray sky. With neither fanfare nor pretense, even Korn explores the plane of a page or canvas and arrangements of thought and action that speak of common experience yet guide viewers to aesthetically higher ground. I've often asked myself what it is that makes this work so damned good. I remember seeing glimpses of even Korn's still lives in the early 70s in an edition of Daniel Mandelowitz's A Guide to Drawing. I noticed an accessibility in the informal but accurate structure of space, and a rich variety of tones smudged and erased, as well as a striking graphic punch to dynamic arrangements of dark and light, which vividly described familiar spatial encounters. I was not alone among aspiring students in finding works of given coin that stuck in my mind like foundational aesthetic architecture. As one looks through the, page, the images of this book, it is impossible to grasp the enthusiastic, it is impossible to grasp the enthusiastic curiosity that shaped and communicated them with such economy and grace. A rigorous aesthetic adventure unites the resonant sense of place and object in all these works. The presence of Eden Korn's mind is so apparent that we are allowed to participate in his active experience of the world. From the nearly abstract oil entitled Beach from 1957 to the hard sharpness of scissors reflected 1964, in my opinion, nobody has ever painted or drawn scissors better. These works provide an argument for representational engagement for all drawing and painting to follow. As a summons to pay attention to the everyday and a reminder of the rewards in doing so. The landscapes and still lives of Richard Gibbon Corner achievements radiant with human reflection and the gravity of knowing. There has never been a time when we have needed as much 
the work can be found in that. It's July 2014. Very nice. I think that's a good place to stop and ask for comments, questions. Thank you. Yes. Well, was most of the work um, that the foundation has that works on paper acquired from his studio? Yes. Yeah, and it turned out uh, another close friend of mine, uh, who was a graduate student friend, had been worked for Atal, a art movie company that was hired to clean the studio at after he died. And he described going into the studio and finding drawer after drawer after drawer, piles of drawings. And, and, and in fact, the numbering system that was on the drawings, as we found them, were, was, was applied originally by Atal, my friend, as part of that. So, yeah, so which explains why a lot of the work has never been, because it was part of the foundation uh, when they were trying to figure out what to do with it. And I think the foundation was created to sort of protect it so that it didn't have to be sold or diminished to pay for taxes. So it, was a, it was a great concept. And in fact, they, in the course of doing this show, um, Wayne Tebow found out about it, and I heard that Wayne Tebow wanted to do something similar. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard that he wanted to have a show at the College of Marin. I haven't, I haven't heard that yet. <laughs> and, but, but he didn't want to set up a foundation of his own because he's facing the same kind of challenge. And I think the Dieberborn Foundation sent them the entire legal framework and, and documents so that he could do that. So, uh, generously, again, I mean, they saved him thousands. Not that he, he's pretty cash, uh, but uh, to set up a foundation of his own, I think, would be a wonder another wonderful uh, thing for, for the world, for our world to have. What, what is the significance that, that a number of uh, the drawings in the show here and in the books are signed by Dean Korn, and the RD, and then, and then a date, and, and many others are not? I can, I can just tell you that um, if, if I pick something or you pick something that we really wanted in these books and Andrea was, mm, I don't know about that, but then she saw the RD, then, or him signing, usually it was just RD, it signified to her, who's been working with these pieces and Stephen Korn's stuff for, for decades now, that it was somehow important. I mean, if he took the time to even put his RD on it, it meant that he valued it in some way. Then he, he would look at it carefully afterwards and decide whether it, it deserved the RD or not. Yeah, I think that's very likely. In fact, there's some pictures. Which book has the pictures, a couple of pictures of him in the studio? Um, I, excuse me, I just don't think that the converse is necessarily true. The fact that he didn't RD the thing doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it's. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We just didn't get around to it because he produced so much stuff. He hadn't really gone through it. Right, for instance, if he was. Let's say he had lived, he could still be alive today, and there was someone who was assembling that show of his drawings. He might go through and select some of those pieces and decide, hmm, I'd better put the RD on it just for the history of sake. If I could remember when they were done. But it also signifies what the artist feels like something that's finished. Right. Any other questions? Well, they were, they have been very active in attending the venues and lecturing very generously. I think uh, his daughter did a wonderful talk here a couple weeks ago. Um, and they were very much interested in having the whole thing happen. They, they were very instrumental in getting the original grants written and make, making that happen. So at this point, it's now a package show that can be sent around. I think the next venue is to University of Montana, which is another one of those places as well. How wonderful for them to get a package like that mm -hmm. and you know, that would even form a show to work with. And it's a way of keeping his, his visual presence alive in the world. Uh, in, and I, I want to say this too, as a, as a member of the community here, how wonderful it is to have a, a museum in town yeah. where so many of these kinds of things can happen. Um, it gives us access to the bigger art world just right down the block. And it's so exciting, I think, for young people. It's a great educational tool here. Um, 
it's, it's just it's been a wonderful experience for me to have worked with the museum over the years in different, different kinds of exhibits. And this one is kind of like the crown of uh, shows. I think it's just a, been a great, great experience all around. I don't know if that answers your question, but that, if they are, they have been, and I think they will continue to uh, probably work out sh similar shows that develop from the archives, so, because they certainly have enough to work with. Yeah, I think they're they're going to be really freed up because the the vast majority of their staff time, which is about seven people, has has been going into this artist resume um, for, like I said, 12, 13, 14 years. So they, I, I just did a book with the Jay DeFeo Foundation, and um, Jay DeFeo works on paper and. They're taking a, a different approach. Um, they're not ready to do the artist resume, and they're very active internationally, having shows all over the world in a way that Stephen Corns, they just haven't done it yet, you know? I mean, there's, there was a show in London this summer, a big, big show, and there's, there's one coming to the, the modern when it opens next year that's going to be called Matisse and Stephen Corn. That's it. I, I imagine the Matisse's name will be first. <laughs> 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 you, you mentioned, I know it has mentioned the show in the Richmond Arts Center. Oh, that's right. Which was a very special, I thought was mm -hmm. great. Before the, it came before the College of Marin, or no? Yeah, it was and after, I think. After? But that, that was a separate, did that show come from the foundation? Did, did the, yeah, as well. Yeah, I think she worked with the foundation. And that had Elmore Bischoff and well, keeping that memory alive is important. I realize that even in my own life, I've been painting for 40 years now, um, that there's a whole generation of people that have never seen the works that I did in the 70s, probably for good reason. But, uh, but it's true, people have a short memory span. Uh, and I think one of the remar my remarks in the catalog was, we, there's never been a time when we more needed the, the kind of contemplation that it takes to appreciate and subject ourselves to the artistic experience of viewing and, and reading, for that matter, uh, because I think it would be a terrible loss to mankind if, if when all the batteries die, <laughs> what's going to be left? I mean, <laughs> if, if the, the books float up on the shelf, the painting will still be hanging on the wall or in a drawer somewhere. Yes, so.